friends. I cannot express my happiness and joy in visiting Hollywood this time and also visiting Santa Barbara and San Diego, which I could not do last time. <coughs> Swamiji has asked me to speak to you on some spiritual topic. <laughs> All of you are spiritual seekers. You are on a spiritual journey. It is a wonderful journey, different from the journey we undertake in space and time. But the spiritual journey is conducted in the context of that other journey in space and time because it is an inward journey. The Upanishads give us beautiful ideas about this inner journey through expositions, illustrations, imageries, some of these Upanishads give us such beautiful description of man's inner journey and fulfillment. Swami Vivekananda, during his lectures in England and America, referred to two such passages in the Upanishads. And when he expounded these passages, as you can note from the Jnana Yoga lectures, Swamiji goes into ecstasy. In his lectures in India, he goes into ecstasy whenever these passages come, because they are highly poetic and deeply mystical and spiritual. So this evening, I shall share with you the three or four verses giving us an insight into man's spiritual journey given by the Mundaka Upanishad, one of the very, very charming Upanishads. It is called the imagery of two birds on same tree, there are two birds, God and the soul. That is the nature of that imagery. I just recite the Sanskrit, translate it, and expound it later on. Dva suparna sayuja sakaya samanam briksham parishasvajate Tayoranya pipalam satvat tananyas anasnan anyo abhijakashiti. On the self same tree are two birds of beautiful plumage, great companions, seated, dva suparna sayuja sakaya, samanam briksham, the same tree, the tree of life the tree of existence, Parishasvajate, both are sitting there. But one bird sitting on the lower branch, it tastes the sweet and bitter fruits of the tree. Tayoranya pippalam swadhu atti. The other bird sitting on the higher branch sits immersed in its own glory, neither eating nor drinking. Anasnan anyo abhijagashiti. It knows its own infinite nature, sits in its own glory. Then bringing this subject to our own life level, the second verse says, Samane vrikshe purusho nimagno anishaya shochati mukhyamanaha Tayoranya pippalam swadvat anasnan nanyo abhijagashiti. 
on the same tree of life is God as well as the soul. Samane Vrikshe Purusho Nimakno This human soul is immersed in the tree. He feels miserable, grief-stricken, helpless. That's the language used there. Samane Vrikshe Purusho Nimakno Anishaya Helpless Shochati Grieves Mukhya Manaha Out of delusion. There is no need for grief. But because he is deluded, he is in grief. Justam yada pasyat yanyamesham. But as a result of various experiences, sometimes happy, sometimes unhappy, pleasant, unpleasant, eating sweet and bitter fruits of life, slowly he moves on, closer, closer. Then a certain stage of life comes, he looks up for the first time and finds his companion. He thought he was alone, helpless all the time, so grieving. Then he looks up, Justam, the worshipful one, the adorable one, is there on the same tree, in the same body, is the divine one also. Justam yada pasyati anyam isham. One by chance, he gets a glimpse of that other bird who is master of it, himself. Then what happens? All sorrows vanish. All helplessness goes away. He realizes his own stature as a close companion of that other bird. Justam yada pasyatyanyamesham asya mahimanamiti vita shokaha he realizes himself as a spark of that great glory of that bird. That glory is reflected in him. He never knew it before. Now he realizes it. So in this wonderful bird imagery is given man's relation to God so close, so intimate, but forgetful. We don't know that he is our own. In this way, this Upanishad expounds this great truth that we are not helpless. The Divine is within us. That is the central teaching that Vivekananda gave in this country after the Parliament of Religions. Man is essentially Divine. He did not remain helpless, but he forget it. That there is another bird sitting on the same tree. Then when we realize that he is there, our helplessness goes away. We become strong. We feel we are not alone. That feeling of strength, fearlessness comes to man. Swami Vivekananda repeatedly stressed, Vedanta teaches fearlessness. It teaches strength. Strength, strength is what the Upanishads preach to me from every page. He said in that lecture, O man, be not weak. Be strong. Are there no human weaknesses then? Asks man. Yes, there are. But will more weakness cure weakness? Can sin wash sin? Can dirt wash dirt? Bring in strength, then weakness will go. Bring in fearlessness, then fear will go. Herein is a great message of fearlessness and strength. This limited human soul, conditioned by the body-mind complex, ever subject to the fear of death, is always full of fear full of helplessness. But when we investigate the nature of experience, we realize that behind this shadow reality of the self is a real self of man, the infinite, the immortal, 
there is one self in all of us. We are not essentially separate from each other. We are essentially one. The journey of man from creatureliness to blessedness is detailed in Vedanta, in the Upanishads. Today I am a creature, but I did not remain a creature, just like any of nature's species. They are all creatures. They are shaped by nature. They have no freedom. And much of humanity also remains in that state of being a creature. Vedanta says, you need not remain a creature. That's not your true status. You are free. You are free. You are the eternal Atman. That is your true nature. It is this profound message that is given to us in all the Upanishads, in the Gita, in the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda today, a universal message for all humanity. No distinction of race, of creed, or sex, none of these, so far as this truth is concerned. In fact, truth is always universal. Any truth is universal. Two plus two, four, is universal. For people everywhere, same truth. Similarly, the truths about nature, which physical science discovers, they are universal. Gravitation is universal. Similarly, the truth about man, his nature, his destiny, is a universal truth. These truths the sages discovered. When their minds became pure, they developed a power of penetration into the heart of truth. And they discovered these truths. When addressing the Chicago Parliament, Vivekananda said, Vedas are eternal. How can a book be eternal? <clears throat> the question was asked. Then he answered, <clears throat> by the Vedas, no books are meant. They are the accumulated treasury of spiritual laws discovered by different persons at different times. And the discoverers of these laws, we call them rishis or sages. Anyone can be a sage. And he added, I am glad to tell this audience that some of the greatest of these sages were women. That is the great teaching. If there is a truth, anybody can discover it. It's only uncovering, discovering. Something covers it. We have to remove it. This human mind can be trained to discover that truth. As in physical science, so in the science of spirituality. There also there are things covering truth. You train the senses, you train the mind, you give that wonderful scientific training to the human mind, trained in scientific methods, and the mind is able to discover the truth hidden in nature. The same kind of training, still more rigorous, can take the mind to the heart of truth within man also. And God is hidden in every human being, said the Upanishads. So wonderful teaching. The verse in which this idea is expressed is a remarkable verse from many points of view. Today we speak of scientific training by which you develop a penetrating power. You are able to discover subtle and subtler truths. Take 17th century science. It could see only gross realities around. Then comes 18th century, still deeper. 19th century, very subtle, like electricity and other things. When you come to the 20th century, mind has become very subtle. It is able to see the subtle aspects of nature. Most of the realities of nuclear science are extremely subtle, not even evident to the sense organs. Still we are able to discover them. Now this development in physical science 
is expounded with respect to the science of man as the Atman in that verse of the Upanishads. It comes in Katha Upanishad, chapter 3. Esha sarvesha bhutesho guru atma na prakashate trishyate tvagriya buddhya sukshmaya sukshma darshibihi. This Atman, the infinite, immortal, divine, is present in every being, every being. Even in insects, it is present. But man alone has the organic capacity to realize this truth. Just like physical scientific truths are there in nature, but no insect can discover it. No animal can discover it. They don't have that organic capacity. But when evolution comes to the human level, nature discovers this truth through the human mind. Similarly, in the spiritual field, man has the organic capacity to realize this truth. How does he do so? That is said in the second line. This infinite Atman is present in every being, but it lies hidden. That is why it is not manifest to the senses. You cannot see the Atman. You can cut the body, dissect it, anatomically study it deeply, you will never see it there. Because it is not a gross reality. That's the language used here. But it can be realized. Drishyate. How? These sense organs are very dull. It is just like this light. I put a cloth in front, I cannot see the light. The senses cannot penetrate. So the senses are dull. They can just see but they cannot perceive. You have to go deep into it. So the mind yoked to the senses gets a little power to deeper perception. That mind has to be trained. So they said, the verse says, Drishyate, this Atman can be realized by all. How? Agriya buddhya, when your reason becomes sharp. Agriya means sharp just like a pointed needle. So sharp it must be. Then it penetrates. Agriya buddhya. But how do you develop it? By training the mind to see subtle, still more subtle and still more subtle truths in experience, you will finally get that subtlest type of mind which can realize the subtlest reality, namely the Atman. That's the language used in the Upanishad. Drishyate Agraya Buddhya Sukshmaya Sukshma Darshibihi Sukshma Darshi You must be a perceiver of subtle truths. Just like a nuclear scientist he is a perceiver of subtle truths. That scientist, if he can use his mind still more deeply to probe into experience, will discover the Atman. Actually today, Many of the great scientists are able to come to the frontier of this great subject and point out the finger, there, there it is. Go ahead, you will discover it there. Amazing, a man like Schrodinger, nuclear scientist, he speaks of the Atman as pure consciousness, one and non-dual in all beings. Consciousness is a singular, of which the plural is unknown. That's what Schrodinger says. So he has a subtle mind. And that subtle mind is able to indicate this truth of the Atman somewhere in experience. The sages did it 4,000 years ago. They gave their mind a tremendous training. When they looked about, they found things and forces can be made penetrating by a certain discipline. Take, for example, air. Air is so flimsy. We call it flimsy like air. But this very air can cut through rocks when it is given compression. Compressed air can cut through rocks. What a tremendous power is there in the air. But normally it is very, very ordinary. Similarly, this radiation, if you just hold a 
paper in front of you, you shut out this radiation. But give it a high frequency discipline, it becomes X-ray, it becomes cosmic ray, it penetrates. They have discovered the truth regarding the human mind. This mind is very, very dull. Take an average individual, never gone to school, no education, nothing. The mind is very dull. A little obstruction, it stops. It cannot go further. So we give children education. Soon as they go to school, even a primary school, mind becomes sharp. A little sharpness comes in. Penetration comes in. Understanding comes in. That training continues. Go into college, postgraduate, then scientific research. You'll find the mind is getting trained in penetration. High frequency mind. You can use that language. Penetrating mind. Every mind can be made like this. That is the message the sages convey to all of us. If by some training you can discover the truth in physical nature, by still more training you can discover the truth about man. And there is a profound truth waiting for you there. Truths in the external world, world are really great. But nothing can compare with this truth in man. The infinite, the immortal and the divine hidden behind this finite human individuality. It was that challenge that the sages took up. This is a real challenge. And you read the Upanishads, you can feel the sense of challenge. It is just like you stand below a mountain, look up at the top. It challenges you. Can you climb? A weak heart will say, no, I can't. A stout heart will say, I shall. I shall go up. I shall climb it. These sages saw these profound truths hidden. They felt they are there. It came a challenge to them. Let us try. Let us try. What shall be the preparation? For mountain climbing, you carry a lot of things, including oxygen, cylinders, so many things you carry. Similarly, in this exploration, into the depths of the human consciousness, you don't need to carry any physical equipment. They will be of no use there. In fact, here is a journey where the supreme motto is travel light. <laughs> That's the meaning of renunciation. People don't know the word renunciation, they're afraid of it. Absolutely, it is a simple word. If you go from this city to the next city, carry a lot of baggage. But if you go to the moon, carry very little baggage. <laughs> that simple truth, we all realize it today. So what do you do? You go on shedding your baggage, even physical baggage. Too much of weight also is not good, physical. <laughs> that pressure also must become less there. So Vedanta speaks of renunciation as a joyous spirit, joyous experience. I am on a long journey. I don't want to carry all this trash. Let it remain here. That's language of renunciation. So when you travel towards the Atman, all these baggages become useless here, including these wonderful gateways of knowledge known as the sensory system. These senses are of no use there. You keep them outside. In physical science, you need the senses. You are dealing with sense data. And you train the senses. Vedanta also says, train your senses. People do not know how to train the senses. They say they see, but seeing is not enough. You must observe. There's a difference between seeing and observing. Any fool can see. Only a scientific mind can observe. So children must be trained in the power of observation. Let these sense organs be properly trained. But only at the level of the physical world. When you transcend this physical world and you are in search of your own infinite nature behind, then you take leave of the sensory system. They are of no use there. Till now they were very useful. Take for example speech. More very important thing is to have speech. A baby begins to speak. He babbles. What a beautiful experience. The baby started speaking. 
this is ma, this is father, this is this, this is that. He is using words. And we train the child to use words. It's a beautiful thing. In the acquisition of knowledge, words are of great importance. Along with words come thought, concepts. Very important. A child develops the capacity for abstract concepts a little later. Both these developments constitute the training to explore the external world. Both language and concepts are needed to explore the external world. Today's physical science has perfected this technique, perfected language, perfected concepts. And they also feel these concepts and words have become helpless. Simply the word electron is only a word. It doesn't show you what is electron. So even in physical science, two instruments which were a supreme significance in the search for knowledge have become utterly helpless, speech and thought. If that is so, in the heart of physical nature, it is much more so when you go beyond the sensory system to see the background of your own consciousness. What is behind this consciousness? What is behind this I? What is this observer and not merely the observed? That is a wonderful area for research. And our teachers say, now take leave of speech, of thought, of your sensory system. They will be of no use there. That is expressed in a beautiful verse in Sanskrit, in the Upanishads. Yato vacho nivartante aprapya manasasaha. That reality from which speech and thought recoil, not being able to comprehend it. What a beautiful idea. Speech, which we try to perfect through grammar, through semantics and so many things, that speech has no value here. So also thought, we sharpened it through logic, scientific method. It has also no place here. Beyond speech and thought, we have to go. What a wonderful journey. What a tremendous journey. And yet, it is a journey. It is like going beyond the solar system. One of our objects today is traveling towards beyond the solar system. Up to the solar system, we can understand. It's our own system. Go beyond the solar system. Similarly, go beyond speech. Go beyond mind. Where you are truly your own true self. That training is a unique training. When you sit in meditation, you are in that training. That's the meaning of meditation. We take leave of the senses. We take leave of this sensory mind. We go deeper. That's inward journey. On that, there's a wonderful verse in this very Upanishad. This Katho Upanishad, same third chapter, or rather, first verse of the fourth chapter. Paranjikani Vyadranat Swayam Bhoho Tasmat Parang Pashyati Nantaratman Kaschit Dheeraha Pratyagatmana Maikshat Avrata Chakshuho Amartatto Michanya In one compressed verse, so much thought is given. This body-mind complex of a human being has many wonderful talents and capacities, but it has one defect, and that defect is it can see things outside. It is outgoing in its disposition. The eyes go out, the mind goes out, outgoing in the disposition. Therefore, it cannot, it cannot see what is behind. What is behind the observer, it cannot see. It can see the observed. That's a defect of the human mind and sensory system a natural defect. Everybody lives with this defect. But one courageous soul said, why should I live with it? I will take it a challenge. I shall give a right about turn to my psychophysical energy system. See the challenge. It is expressed there. I shall give a right about turn to my psychophysical energy system. Now it goes out 
I will turn it in. That's called avrta chakshuhu, a very fine technical term. Turn right about the entire energy that is in you. Then find out what you are. Then you will realize yourself. Logic <coughs> convinces us that it is true. If by looking out I can see an object there, looking in I can see the subject. The observer, there is no other way. Looking out I can never see the observer. <coughs> and today, in nuclear science, this whole subject has come to a prominent position. The observer has become an important datum in the observation of physical phenomena in nuclear physics. The explanation is that the very presence of the observer disturbs the observed data. The observer's an observer is an important datum. Therefore, some scientists will give a new name to the observer. Scientist, physicist, A. H. Wheeler. He calls the observer the participator. He participates in the creation of knowledge. What a wonderful revolution. It was not so in Newton's physics, the whole of 19th century physics. So in 20th century physics, the observer has become an important datum in understanding the observed data. So let us turn the searchlight on to the observer. Who is this observer? What is his nature? It becomes a valid question, even in physical science. That's what you find hinted in many books on nuclear science. So in Vedanta, we ask this question. If by looking out through the senses and the mind, I can see the observed data, it follows logically. If I can give a right about turn to my energy system, I must certainly be able to understand what is this observer, what is this self, what is this subject. And there is one motivation for this new investigation. Whatever I see outside is subject to change. Everything is subject to change. In fact, in particle physics, you are in touch with realities whose existence is only a fraction of a second. Constant change, change, change. The whole world is full of change. Even these molecular structures, they change completely. So death reigns supreme in the world of the object. If there is anything deathless, anything immortal, you must seek it in the subject, in the observer, not in the observed. This is just the logic behind turning attention from external to internal. If there is a God, and God must necessarily be mortal, infinite, etc. A dying God, nobody will worship him. So if there is a God, let me seek for him here, not there. You can't see God with a telescope. That's what we thought till now in theology. Somewhere in the starry heavens, a God is there. As they say in American weeklies, the bearded old man in the sky, he is dead. We have to pronounce him dead now. God is dead, we say. Why? You put him in the wrong place. In the world of death, how can you find God there? Let us try in the other dimension, in the subject dimension, self-dimension, observer dimension. If I can penetrate various layers of personality, which are also subject to death, the body is only external nature given here. The nervous system, sensory system, even the psyche, these are all part of the world out there. Now where you will find the Atman, if you can penetrate still deeper, it is extremely difficult. The gravitational pull of this whole body-mind complex is very, very strong. Just like when we started the space age 20, 25 years ago, we started sending small rockets up. The maximum distance they could go was 60 miles. First rockets, they just went up and came. There was no boosting power because so much gravity is there. Then we started strengthening that boosting power by which it can go higher and higher and higher until we discovered such fuels which could power a rocket 
which can go beyond the gravitational field of the earth. And they began to go around the earth. These are all great achievements in the modern period. Then we started sending still further. Million, million horsepower rockets they could discover. Then they could go to the moon. Now they are going to the Saturn, Neptune, and Pluto, and beyond solar system. Identically, this human mind needs a thrust. Much of it is countered by the gravitational pull of the biological system of man. Why the word renunciation comes into this picture, you will realize now. Renunciation is the supreme means by which you can realize the Atman. Thin yourself, then gravitational pull will be less. Fatten yourself, gravitational pull is more. So renunciation is a natural, spontaneous thinning oneself of all some scars, tendencies, impressions that have gathered in the mind from our past association with the world of the objects. That is why the Upanishads proclaim unequivocally that through renunciation alone, immortality can be gained. Nakarmana. These are all great utterances in the Upanishads. Nakarmana. Naprajaya. Dhanena. Tyage naike amrutattva manashuhu. Not through actions. Not through progeny. Not through wealth. Can immortality be gained. Only through renunciation. That is the logic of this great utterance that when you want to penetrate deep, you want to have a thrust. You don't want to be dragged down by the gravity that is existing all the time. That thrust is given, renunciation and love of truth. These two together, as they become intensified, the thrust becomes more and more. A Ramakrishna's mind, in a trice it could go in the transcendental realm when he was under Tautabari's discipleship, his mind straight away went to the highest level. No gravitation. So wonderful mind it was. Similarly, Buddha. So all these experiences tell us that if you want to give a right about turn to your sensory and mental system, you must live a simple life. That is absolutely essential. Too much of baggage will not help us there. So it becomes a natural renunciation. I want to get something higher. So I shed all these things. I want to climb Mount Everest. I carry a lot of baggage on the first stage. Then it becomes thinned, second stage, third stage. In the last stage only you are going there. No baggage at all. That's a wonderful idea. Not only no baggage. We don't go in a crowd to realize truth. Society is there in our external life. In that life, there is no society. You are all alone. Husband, wife, son, daughter, all are meditating. As soon as they start meditating, there is no husband, no wife, no son, no daughter. It's an entirely private journey, not in a crowd. Mountain climbing is exactly the same. You go in a thousand crowd party to start mountain climbing. Every step you thin down, thin down, and at the crest only one at a time. One of our great philosophers, who was the president of India, Dr. Radhakrishnan, a brilliant philosopher, he expressed it in a wonderful sentence. He says, in the last stages of life's journey, man travels in single file, not in double file, not in triple file. He never go in a crowd. That's what Jesus said, that in the kingdom of heaven, there is neither husband nor wife. People couldn't understand what he meant there. Here in this wonderful journey, we must have the capacity to enjoy aloneness. No crowd there. Then, renunciation becomes natural. We shall enter the crowd once again, after having a vision of truth a completely transformed human situation, full of joy in dealing with human beings at that time. But in the beginning, we say goodbye. Let me undertake this journey. That's meaning of meditation. 
It is like a man, number of people swimming on the sea, head is bobbing everywhere, then one dives. Suddenly one is gone. Where is he gone? Dive deep, he is gone. Then he comes up again, he can see again. So this diving deep is a wonderful experience. In the Gospel of Ramakrishna, you find songs dealing with the subject. One he often used to sing, dive deep, dive deep, dive deep, O thou mind. You will come across tremendous treasures at the depth of the ocean. On the surface you get only cheap shells, pearls lie deep in the ocean. So in meditation, there is this diving deep. But to be able to dive deep, you must have stamina. That stamina comes through renunciation. That's why the Upanishad said, through renunciation alone, the highest immortal reality can be realized. The greatest sage of the Upanishads was Yatnya Valkya. There is a beautiful chapter in the Brihad Aranika Upanishad. Yatnya Valkya's discourse to his wife Maitri. Yatnya Valkya said, I have lived a wonderful life with you and with my other wife, Katyayani. Now I want to renounce everything and go to the forest. I want to divide my property between you two. Take it and be happy. Maitri immediately asked, Will this property make me immortal? Help me to attain immortality? Yajna Vilke said, No. Property and wealth cannot make you immortal. It will help you to live a decent life. That's all. But not immortality. Then she said, Keep the wealth yourself. Tell me how I can become immortal. In answer to it, a beautiful discourse Yajna Vilke gives to his wife. In all these teachings you will find this material civilization is beautiful. We can live a comfortable life, a nice life, but it is not perfect. One whole side of truth is unknown to it. If only we can know that also, then this life will become really fine. Why only one side? So this tremendous search for the spiritual meaning of life you find all over the world today. Among scientists also, there is some wonderful exploration waiting by, to be done by all of us. We started the modern age as the age of exploration. First, America was discovered by Columbus. It was an unknown land. Then, other parts of the world. Then North Pole, then South Pole. And today, every square inch of the earth we know. Then we went down the ocean. Then we started going up the air, up the mountains. Then space exploration. So that exploration is a great word. And modern age started as the age of exploration. One writer, writing in a scientific journal, the Siemens Journal, mentions all this and says, we have done a lot of exploration. But one entire area is unexplored by man. Now we must do it. What is that? The hinterland of our own consciousness. That exploration must start now. This is in a scientific journal. And when you look to the Upanishad, that is what they did. 4,000 years ago, mapping every inch on the road and what lies at the head of it. What did they find there? At the end of the journey, the mortal behind the mortal. The mortal man behind the mortal man. That was a tremendous discovery. That is what this shloka, this word said. Kaschit dhiraha. A certain heroic soul. We don't know who he was. Can we find out who discovered God first? Who discovered the Atman first? There's no historical, what you call facts at all. All the greatest discoveries of the past ages were by unknown people. Who discovered fire? We don't know. But it revolutionized human life. Who discovered the wheel? We don't know. Similarly, who discovered the way to God? We don't know. So he says, Kaschit Dhira. A certain Dhira. Dhira means intelligent, courageous person with that pioneering spirit. Kaschit Dhira. He realized the Pratyaga Atman. 
pratyega utpana maichat. He realized the infinite Atman. How? Avrutta chakshuhu. By giving a right about turn to his whole psychophysical energy system. What was his intention? To find out whether there is anything changeless in this world of change. Anything immortal in this world of death. Outwardly everything is mortal. Everything is subject to death. Close up, full of change. Further up, more change. Go to the depths of space, it is all change. So, he just told himself, if at all there is any area where deathlessness can be found, it must be in the inner dimension, not in the outer. So as a trial, he just took up this plunge. And then he found, yes, the mortal has been gained by me. He said, the same thing Buddha repeated thousand years later. He just spent in meditation a whole night. Morning got up. The mortal has been gained by me. He became the illumined one. This is a tremendous journey. This is the meaning of meditation. Shankaracharya writing his commentary on this verse of the Upanishad. Verse 1, chapter 4, Kato Upanishad. He gives a modern touch to that commentary. He says, this is an impossible task. Turning the mind and senses inward, even a little angle change is difficult for us. What to speak of complete reversal, the whole energy of the mind. It is like, he says, a river is flowing east. Our agriculture and technology needs, it should flow west. So we make it flow west, though it is flowing east. Man can do it. Similarly, this pioneer gave a right about turn to his psychic energy system and discovered the mortal behind the mortal. What a joyous discovery it was. Here in this very body, in this very life, he discovered this truth. That is Vedanta. He did it. Can I do it? Yes, sir, you also can do it. It is everybody's birthright. Only train the mind. You may not do it as quickly as he did, but slowly you can do. Give it a slight turn, slight turn, like this. So, a new technique is developed where the senses and the mind are of no use. Language and concept are of no use. You have to go every, in, a, in a different stage, in a different direction. That's the meaning of meditation. When we turn the mind back on itself, and if the mind is pure, it gets the power of penetration. A high frequency mind is created by purity, detachment. These are the two things by which the mind develops the capacity to go deeper and deeper. Everyone will achieve it. Nobody need be despair. Oh, I am not able to handle the mind. In the beginning, it is difficult. It is accustomed to go outside, but slowly, by training, just like a child, a little boy has a little muscle. He goes to a physical institute and slowly takes dumbbells, exercise, and the big muscle develops. Similarly, the mind, we can develop its strength, its penetration by practice. Krishna constantly mentioned this in the Gita. This mind can be trained and disciplined through constant practice and detachment. Detachment. Here is a fierce tiger. You go near it, it growls, you run away. After six months, it has become a tame animal and playing in the circus. That taming is a wonderful method. The mind must be tamed like this. Through kind ways, loving ways, gentle ways, you train the mind. Don't fight with it too much, but gently train it. That's what the teachers constantly emphasize. Then one day, this mind developed that capacity to penetrate inward and we realize the truth. Let it take a lifetime. Let it take a ten lives. What does it matter? It is worth doing. If there is gold somewhere in the West, we all rushed towards it in the last century. Many died because they wanted gold. If the gold is such a precious thing, life is no meaning. We must have the gold. Similarly, when God is hidden in human experience, we say, we shall do everything to achieve it. You don't mind any sacrifice 
too great. That is the Vedantic earnestness. Tremendous energy comes out of that. And when you start on this journey, you say goodbye to the past life. All those things that interested you become of no interest to you. It's a tremendous interest in itself. That's the nature of spiritual hunger, spiritual pursuit, spiritual journey. A journey which needs for its success, determination. A new motto we have to give to ourselves. A motto such as given by Nansen when he started on his North Pole exploration. He built a ship for his North Pole journey. His wife gave a name to it, Fram in Norwegian. Fram means forward. We want a forward ship, not a backward ship. So the mind must be forward. So after giving that name, before he started on his journey, he gave a motto to himself. Every spiritual seeker must give a motto like this to himself or to herself. Nansen said, when you are on a great adventure, do two things. One, cut the ropes. Two, burn the bridges behind you. Then only forward remains for you. What a beautiful message. I love it immensely. It has got a Vedantic touch. Arise, awake and stop now till the goal is reached. Vivekananda's famous passage from the Kathopanishad. So here is, failure is no deterring at all. I will fail, I will try again. I will fail, I will try again. But truth is there. I sent it, I will get it. That is a Vedantic determination. That is how great sages discovered this truth. Fortunately, by their great pioneering efforts, our path has become much easier. Pioneer always has a bad time. You know the American pioneers. There was nothing here. What a hard time. Today, everything, you just switch the thing, you get everything. That was not so in the 17th century for settlers here. So, due to this work of these great teachers, those who have gone before us, our path is much easier, much simpler. And yet, it is hard enough. It's not easy. It is like walking on the edge of a razor, says the same Upanishad. Shurasya dhara nishita duratyaya durgam patastat kavayo vadanti After saying, uttishthata jagrata prapya varan nibodhata Arise, awake, enlighten yourself by approaching the enlightened ones. Saying this, the next line says, the path is like walking on the edge of a razor, difficult to tread, hard to cross. You may cut to peace any moment, yet we dare it. That daring is needed in all great adventure, including this great test adventure, discovering the infinite in the finite, deathless in the death, de deathful and the mortal in the mortal. That is the great message of the Upanishads, man's inward journey. Every step in this journey makes the outward journey more pleasant, more sweet. Our whole outlook on life changes, hatred vanishes, love comes. Compassion comes. When we are in this journey, we are touching the Atman closer and closer. And when we look out, we see things in a new light. That's why ethical values, moral values, humanistic values become byproducts of man's spiritual growth. You don't strive for it. They come automatically when you are in your spiritual journey. This is how Vedanta describes man's search for truth, first in the external world, through physical science, and second, into the heart of man, discovering the mortal behind the mortal. This discovery is what is conveyed to us in the short pithy formula of the Chandogya Upanishad. Tattomasi, Tattomasi, you are that, you are that. Don't evaluate yourself from your sensory point of view. From sensory point of view, you are a speck of dust in the vast immensity of nature. Don't evaluate yourself from that point of view. You miss something tremendous. Your true nature is that, that infinite Atman, 
That is your true nature. Tattomasi, Tattomasi. Realize this truth. Repeat these saving words, Vivekananda said. I am the Atman. I am free. I am free. That is the great mantra to be uttered by every human being. That is the truth about him. Only he doesn't know it. But not knowing doesn't abolish the truth. Not knowing gravitation doesn't abolish the truth of gravitation. Similarly, not knowing I am the infinite Atman, I am ever free, I am pure, doesn't abolish it. We are only that much bad because we don't know the truth. So go towards the truth, go towards the light, go towards immortality. This is the great prayer of the human heart which is given expression in a famous Sanskrit prayer in the same Brihad Arnika Upanishad. We often recite it here. Asato ma sadgamaya Tamaso ma jyodargamaya Mrityor ma amratangamaya Lead us from the unreal to the real Lead us from darkness to light Lead us from death to immortality That is the journey which we call religion in the pure sense of the term Not as ethnical religions but as the science of religion the science of man's spiritual growth development and fulfillment and it is to be had here and now in this very body not in some post-mortem condition that's the Vedantic promise because it is our true nature it is our birthright the Atman is the birthright of all only we must turn in that direction then this life becomes more meaningful in the light of that search outer life becomes meaningful take that search away outer life becomes absolutely sterile. It becomes, in the language of Shakespeare, a tale told by an idiot, the external life of man. Cut off from that infinite Atman, the world becomes a zero. Ramakrishna said, zeros have no value. Put one zero, two zero, three zero, no value. Put one behind, full of value. That one is this infinite Atman. Then the world, full of value, full of beauty, full of charm. The real beauty of the world will be revealed when we realize the beauty of God, the beauty of the Atman. There are some wonderful passages in the Upanishads where the sage goes into ecstasy seeing the beauty of this universe proceeding from the beauty of God. Ananda Rupam, the blissful form, Amrutam, the immortal, yet Yatvipadi, that shines all over here. Having discovered the Atman, he opened the eyes. Everything is bliss. Everything is wave and wave of bliss in the world outside. Wave of beauty in the world outside. That is the language of realization. Here Ramakrishna sees everything full of beauty and charm, full of love everywhere. He enjoys the company of human beings because he sees God in every one of them. I see Narayana in every being. He said, that is the highest vision. See God in everything in this world. Close your eyes, discover the Atman. Open your eyes, see Him everywhere. A transformed life that is sung in the Shvetashvatara Upanishad. In Ramakrishna's teachings and sayings you find plenty. The Upanishad said, Tvam Stri, Tvam Pumanasi, Tvam Kumara Utava Kumari, Tvam jirno dande na vanchasi, tvam jato bhavasi, vishvato mukaha. Having realized this truth, when the sage opened the eyes, what did he see? Tvam stri, thou art the woman. Tvam pumanasi, thou art the man. Tvam kumara, thou art that youth. Putava kumari, thou art that maiden. Tvam jirno dande na vanchasi, you are that old man tottering on his sticks. Tvam jato bhavasi vishyato mukhava You are born in this multiform ways in this world. What a transformed vision. Nothing of evil. Nothing limited. Everything become glowing with the touch of the divine. That was Ramakrishna's experience. In the gospel of Ramakrishna you find plenty of his sayings in this direction. The Upanishad is full of that. Brahman in front, Brahman behind, Brahman left, Brahman right, like that there is a passage in the Upanishad. Everywhere, nothing but Brahman. I am, he says, 
in that Vivek Jaramani. I am like a small hailstone that fell from the sky into the ocean. I remain as I for one minute and I melted away into the infinite ocean. That is Brahman. That is this I in man, melting in the infinite ocean of pure consciousness. That is the highest spiritual realization. We start on the journey. Whatever stage it be, it is spiritual journey. It is spiritual experience. Every step, it is spiritual experience. Maybe a million miles away. What does it matter? I shall walk on. Walk on. One day, we shall reach. A river starts on the mountain. Goes on, crooked here and there. Finally, he finds his way to the sea. So also is the human soul. Look up. When you look up, the other bird is there. Infinite, immortal. Justam yada pasyatyanyameshim. Asya mahimanamiti. Vita shodha. When I see the other bird, the infinite, the immortal, divine, this soul which is limited, full of sorrow and grief, gives up that grief, gives up helplessness, realizes its own true nature. That is the story of man's journey to truth and to fulfillment. Thank you.